If you are worried you have Lyme disease, or just like the outdoors, and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Hi, everybody. My name is Robert Harriman, and welcome to the show. Now, tapeworms or cestodes continue to be an important cause of disease and illness in humans worldwide. Diphilobothrium latum and related species, the fish or broad tapeworm, are the largest tapeworms that can infect people. To learn more about diphilobothriosis, I am joined again by Rosemary Drizdell. Rosemary is a parasitology teacher and the author of Parasites, Tales of Humanity's Most Unwelcome Guest. Hi, Rosemary, and welcome back to the show. Hi, Robert. Nice to be here. Okay. So, what is a tapeworm or a cestode, and, and how does it differ from other parasites? Well, it's a worm, obviously. These are the tapeworm, the worms that look like tapes or ribbons, or some people would describe them as looking like long strips of frilly noodle. They live in the small intestine attached actually to the lining of the small intestine and they grow rather like a string of beads. So they produce a segment and then they produce another segment and another until they get really incredibly long. And as you said, Diphilobothrium is the largest known. Most of the textbooks say that it can get up to about 35 feet in length, although some go for an even longer length. Quite an impressive size. Now, Diphilobothrium latum is the most common, um, although there's other uh, additional species that can affect people. Now, how common is it worldwide, and how common is, is it here in North America? It's difficult to put your finger on an actual figure as to how common it is worldwide for several reasons, but the, the foremost is that it's not a reportable pathogen in a lot of places, so we don't have good statistics. From perhaps 10 years ago, an estimate of maybe 9 million, somewhere between 9 and 20 million people infected worldwide. It's not as common here in North America as it is in some other countries. However, there's also the confusion of you, where you would expect it to be perhaps growing less common because of improved methods of preventing infection. In some places, it's actually becoming more common because of people's changing eating habits. So it is hard to know exactly how many. So there may be quite a low incidence in North America. So outside of North America, what countries is uh, D. Latum found? It's known to be endemic in lots of areas of the northern hemisphere, so above the equator. In North America, around the, the prairies in that area are kind of famous for it, but also in Asia and northern Europe, it's, that's where you find the concentration of infection. So is, um, and it's found in cooler water, so in the U.S. and Canada, you, would, you might find that where in the Great Lakes or... Yes, and as I said, in the lakes, in the prairies, in the Manitoba area. Okay. Uh, is, is where it's best known for. Um, I was going to add something to that, and now it's slid my mind, but it'll be back. Okay. <laughs> Not a problem. Yeah. Now, it's also known as the broad tapeworm or the fish tapeworm. Uh, how did it get these nicknames? I can't speak with authority to where the name broad tapeworm came from, but intuitively it's because the segments of the worm are wider than they are long. Whereas typically when we see segments of other common tapeworms, like the beef tapeworm and the pork tapeworm, they're usually longer than they are wide. So it is literally, in shape, quite broad. 
and fish tapeworm because it's associated with eating undercooked fish. Now, for many years, we've been waiting for a Lyme disease test that actually works. After decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at the Medical Center at Virginia Commonwealth University, a breakthrough test has been developed. The GLD test, recently launched by Global Lyme Diagnostics, is based on Dr. Marconi's science. For more information, visit glymedx.com, that's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com, or email at info at glymedx.com. Now, Rosemary, the, the life cycle is fairly complex, and it requires multiple hosts. Can you talk about that? That's right. If you have a uh, diphilobothrium tapeworm living in your intestine, you'll pass perhaps a million or more eggs a day, along with perhaps some of the segments, the proglottids of the tapeworm. If you pass these eggs into the water, then they can be eaten by a small copepod, a small water creature. It's one of the plankton. So the parasite develops within the plankton, and then the plankton is eaten by a fish migrates to the muscle tissue or the visceral organs, the abdominal organs of the fish. Now, interestingly, it's not necessarily that fish that the definitive host would eat, but that fish can be eaten by a larger fish and that fish by a larger fish and so on. And the parasite simply migrates from the tissues of the fish that is eaten into the tissues of the larger fish. So it could be a a fish as small as a little minnow that you'd never be likely to eat that becomes initially infected, but you might catch a larger fish, a much larger fish later, and eat that fish without properly cooking it. And the larvae are insisted in the muscle tissues of the fish and then grow to be the adult tapeworm in the intestine. So it requires two intermediate hosts, that little copepod or plankton, and then a fish. And... Uh, it- Obviously, fish is the way people um, contract it, uh, undercooked fish, raw fish, I imagine. Right. Yeah. Um, what are the signs and symptoms of diphilobothrium latum? Sometimes there aren't any symptoms at all. As with most of the tapeworms, you can be completely unaware that you have a parasite until you perhaps pass a strip of proglottids or something with a bowel movement. But some people complain of vague abdominal discomfort, perhaps a kind of rumbliness in the tummy. They may feel tired and weak, a little dizzy. Some people have diarrhea, feel hungry all the time. And in certain individuals, an anemia develops because the the tapeworm actually absorbs vitamin B12 from the intestinal contents and thereby robs it from the host. So vitamin B12 deficiency can develop, and along with that comes anemia. We're not sure why some people get these symptoms and others don't. It could be something to do with the size of the worm. It could have to do with individual susceptibility to the infection. We're just not sure. But the anemia is actually, although a famous symptom, not all that common. Hmm. Um, So let's talk about diagnosis and treatment. Pretty straightforward? That's right. As with most worms, we diagnose it by either getting a piece of the worm. If the patient passes a strip of proglottids and they send that to the lab, we can identify that to species or at least to genus. As you mentioned, there are a lot of different species of diphilobothrium that are now known to infect people. So it's more common today for us to simply say diphilobothrium species rather than to try and speciate it down precisely. And we also have methods in the lab where we can concentrate things like worm eggs and more or less pull them out of a stool sample so that we're able to see them and identify them based on the way they look. It's treated with antiparasitics quite simply, usually praziquantel. That would be the first choice. Now, prevention, I mean, I think the average listener could probably figure out what prevention is here. It's really quite simple. Don't eat undercooked fish. Correct. The life cycle is dependent on human feces entering the water that contain the eggs, the presence of appropriate fish and plankton in that water, and then eating the fish undercooked. So there's two obvious places where we can break the life cycle. One is by not eating that fish without thoroughly cooking it, and the other is to prevent human waste from entering the water in the first place. So good sanitation is one way to break the life cycle. And that's one of the reasons why 
the incidence of this infection is falling in many parts of the world. Now, Rosemary, do you have any interesting tales to tell about Diphilobothrium latum? Well, you may have heard that parasitologists tend to be a little bit more welcoming to parasites than the general public, sometimes even making them quite at home. There's a story of a parasitologist by the name of Robin Overstreet who wanted to do some research on Diphilobothrium. And while he was visiting a, lab, visiting a laboratory in Finland, he deliberately infected himself with Diphilobothrium in order to bring the parasite home to Mississippi. Now, what better way to get across an international border? You don't have to declare your intestinal contents when you go through customs, right? So he got his worm safely home, and he continued to pro provide a worm for it while collecting the eggs from his own feces to do his research. Eventually, however, with deep regret, he had to treat himself because he was starting to get some symptoms of an uncomfortable, you know, vague symptoms in his tummy, and apparently he was less concerned about that than about the fact that this might be detrimental to his tennis game. You know, you really got me on that one because I thought you were going to go the Robert Desowitz route on this one from the book. <laughs> yes. The, 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 about, can, uh, can you tell the story about the Jewish grandmothers? Well, that's right. There was an outbreak of diphilobothriasis in the Jewish community, and it was uh, largely in the older women. And it was simply because they were making a dish called gefelt fish, and they would tend to taste the dish to see if it was done. So obviously, if it wasn't done, that could be quite a dangerous thing to do, because if the larvae of the tapeworm were there, then they would become infected. And so that's what they were doing. That's a dangerous way to test, test whether your gefelt fish is sufficiently done. <laughs> yeah, that's a fascinating book and a fascinating story. Yes, it's a good book. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, thank you again, Rosemary. I appreciate you coming on. Informative as always. Oh, well, it was my pleasure. All right, thank you.